one. Good day and welcome to our webcast, part of the IIoT Cloud Series, Subject Matter Experts and Enterprise Analytics, brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by Epicor. Today we'll be joined by Ed Kuzemchik and Sam Fonestock of Software Design Solutions. I'm Kevin Parker, an editor with CFE Media and Technology. Today's presentation can provide continuing education credits. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RECEP at RECEP.net. A certificate will be available for each participant to download upon successful completion of a test at the end of the presentations. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RECEP. To take the Learning Unit Exam, use the Learning Unit Exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a separate browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting your computer's volume or by adjusting the volume on the platform. If you are having technical problems with the audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. You can also type questions for our speakers in the Ask a Question box. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a PDF copy of the presentation and other additional resources, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of the screen. These documents will also be available with the on-demand version of the webcast. The exam will be posted on CFE Media websites with the on-demand version of this webcast. The exam is for one RECEP ASIC Certified Professional Development Hour. Before beginning the presentations, we invite you to view the following short video provided by today's sponsor, Epicor. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned. Manufacturers are facing a barrage of information about how new disruptive technologies will change the face of their industry. But for manufacturers to embrace mobile, social, analytics, cloud, and industry 4.0, they must have a clear understanding of the technology value add within the context of today's business environment. With all this talk about Industry 4.0 and data deluge from all the interconnected devices on the factory floor and analysis in the back office, manufacturers may wonder, where does ERP fit into this new digital frontier? The reality is that ERP is more relevant in this equation than ever before, and manufacturers need the ability to contextualize data and integrate it into downstream process flows. To do this, ERP systems must be reimagined to meet the needs of new and emerging manufacturing technologies. Responsiveness demands simplicity and mobility with tools designed to meet the specific needs of specific users. With an ERP system that delivers this, manufacturers can check off a big box on their Industry 4.0 readiness checklist and make good on the promise of real-time, actionable intelligence. Welcome back. I'd now like to introduce today's speakers. Sam Fonestock is Engineering Manager and Lead Security Engineer for Software Design Solutions, an Applied Visions company. As Engineering Manager, Sam coaches team members across the company on implementing agile mindset and practices. As the Lead Security Engineer, Sam plays a vital role in incorporating security into projects across SDS. Prior to Software Design Solutions, Sam spent nine years 
working in cybersecurity as an Air Force civilian at the Air Force Cyber Emergency Response Team, doing vulnerability analysis, penetration testing, and managing the cyber defense team. Sam moved on to Booz Allen Hamilton, building cyber defense software for the Air Force's 90th Information Operations Warfare Squadron. It was at Booz Allen Hamilton that Sam learned and grew his knowledge of agile and process management. Sam is an IC Agile certified Agile coach and has taught courses on Agile mindset and methodology. Sam blogs on cybersecurity and Agile topics at softwaredesignsolutions.com. Ed Kuzemchek is the CTO and Director of IoT and Embedded Systems Engineering at Software Design Solutions. Ed founded Software Design Solutions in 2003, focusing the company on embedded systems, machine to machine, and IIoT software development. He led the growth of the company from inception to its acquisition by Applied Visions in 2016. Prior to founding Software Design Solutions, Ed was Chief Software Architect for the Digital Signal Processing Tools Group at Texas Instruments and a member of Tartan Laboratories, which developed highly optimized compiler technology for embedded systems. Ed holds a master's degree in computer science from the University of Pittsburgh. He is the author of several patents on embedded system software. Thank you for joining us today, Ed. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me, Kevin. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today as we talk about data and how it relates to your IoT project. And so I'm gonna be talking about a number of different things. We're gonna be talking about how to identify data, what data you should consider collecting, how to collect and analyze data, how to involve the stakeholders in your project, and also, most importantly, how to get started. So let's begin just with an introduction to kind of level set everyone and, and, and kind of start from a foundation, uh, at least of, of vocabulary. Um, what you see here is a typical three-tier IoT application or, or design. And at the bottom is sensors, and these are sensing the physical world. And so this might be temperature sensors or vibration or, or any kinds of any kind of sensor that you might mount on can think of it as a, as a sensor on an industrial machine of some kind. And those sensors are collecting data, but we consider that to be raw data. In other words, you know, a, a temperature sensor is just, is just collecting a specific scale or temperature value. It doesn't have a whole lot of meaning if you don't know whether that temperature is too warm, too cold. So it's, it's, it's a raw piece of data. And data can exist in many forms in an IoT project, and it's important to understand that as you begin to think about subject matter experts and their use of data, analytics and its use of data. And so these sensors, they're collecting a lot of data, and they normally will pass that data up one level to mostly what we can all consider gateways. Um, the gateway grabs that data from the sensor and may do some simple processing on it, may pass it through to the, to the cloud. Um, often they do a little bit of simple processing there, but that data eventually makes it up to some cloud application. And this is what people really think about when they think about IoT. They think about fancy dashboards and fancy analytics and, and you know, your washing machine ordering a part for itself before, before it fails. It's all of those things that people think of when they think of IoT, but underpinning all of that is all of this data that's being collected. So it's important to understand these different forms that data can take because the raw data down at the sensors, as I mentioned, this data doesn't mean a whole lot and there's a whole lot of it. So if you have a sensor down there that's collecting temperature on an industrial machine, it might be able to collect uh, the temperature value 10 times a second, let's say. And that's, you know, that's, that's great. Um, but if you send all of that data up to the cloud, 10 times a second is around 800,000 samples in a day. And you really don't want to deal with 800,000 temperature samples per day, per machine, or even per bearing on that machine. And you don't need to either. And so that data needs to be analyzed along the way. You don't just collect it all and sort it out later. So the, 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 in, in the example that I just gave, this temperature sensor might collect that data 10 times a second. It might not even send every one of those. 
samples. It may do some local averaging, filtering, these kinds of things, things that, things that people have been doing for a long time, and send up to the gateway maybe every second. The gateway probably won't send every one of those up to the cloud because, again, even at every second, that's 86,000 samples a day. And so you know, we're really not interested in that many samples either. The gateway might just kind of watch and say, you know, if this temperature is within a reasonable range, I'm just going to keep it around and I'm going to send every five minutes a summary up to the cloud. Maybe a low, a high, an average, a median, a mean. And so that way the gateway is doing some analyses of that data and what is sending up is no longer raw data but some sort of interpreted data so that the cloud does not have to deal with you know, the processing up there and the storage up there and potentially the communications that needs to happen, you know, the, the, the line from the uh, on property up to the cloud might be cellular. You don't want to pay those, uh, those cellular bills. And so I think that, you know, having this idea that the data exists in many places, many forms is important. And the idea that IoT lets you collect better data, um, but it doesn't replace having good analysis for it. We'll talk about that later. The most important thing is when you go to get started, who needs to be at the table? So let's talk about that. So when you begin to think about an IoT project, um, certainly uh, often IoT projects are, are uh, sponsored at the C-level. And so you have some sort of C-level sponsorship, C-level support. These are the folks that certainly have um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of goal-oriented requirements. They're saying things like, look, we want to reduce downtime. We want to improve efficiency. We want to improve um, productivity. So those are goal-oriented requirements. And you know, getting it done is where the rest of the team comes into play. So going clockwise around this picture, we have IoT engineers. These are folks that understand what is a what is able to be um, um, sensed in terms of sensors. They understand what data analyses are, are available. Often in an organization that is just starting out with IoT, these aren't folks inside the organization, but rather outside. Um, in our role, this is usually this is usually our role at the table in SDS, um, is, 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 that, is, is in that type of, of consultation. Then down around here at, uh, at, at five o'clock on the picture is operations. These are the ops folks inside the company. They understand the company's processes. They understand what all the inputs and outputs to everything are. They understand the, the, the resource planning that needs to go on to make, a, to make the, the, the company run. And so they hold a lot of procedural data that is important to any successful IoT project. Then around here at seven o'clock is, is IT very important to engage IT early because if you realize that you know we're going to have data and we're going to need to move that data around and very quickly that's going to involve something with the, with the company network or maybe outside the company network and so getting IT involved early is very important for this for the long-term success of, a, of an IOT project lastly there's these folks that we call domain experts um, we're going to, have to talk a lot about domain experts in the next five, ten minutes, and, and that is the, just for now. Let's just say that they're the folks that understand the minute details about the system and how it works, and, and what would be important if you were going to collect data. So when it, when you begin looking at a uh, at an IoT project, and even looking at data and subject matter, what data should you collect? And I think that there's, there's three roles that interact when you start doing this. First is these domain experts, and we'll talk about them in a minute. But they really will, will um, contribute the, the, the answer to the question, what information analyses are important? If I had better data about X, things would be better. You know, we could, we could be more efficient if we just had better data about that machine, or we just had better data about that process. Then we also have sensor engineers. These are folks that understand well what data can be collected. 
it's no good to say, boy, I wish we had you know, vibration data about this system. If you come to realize you can't collect vibration data about that system for some reason, perhaps it's you know, too remote and you can't even send the data for, that you want to send. And so you have to deal with a proxy of, of what vibration data would be. And this is where sensor engineers come into play. And then finally, there's data engineers, which are, if you collect, if, if you decided what data was going to be important from your domain experts, and you decided that you could collect it or how you would collect it from your sensor engineers, how would you then analyze that data? And this is where the data engineers come into play. And this is, you know, the, the arrows here are, are a cycle. And I think Sam will talk a great deal about this, that, that this is an iterative process where, where you start small and you, and you continue to iterate through various uh, re revolutions of this, of this picture. So let's talk about domain experts. Um, who are they? Uh, well, I would say that I have a, I have a, 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 a brash statistic here. 99% of the time, they're already on your staff. There's no one that understands your domain better than the folks that you already have hired. Um, and, and, and if they're not, if they understand your, your business and they're not on your staff, they're probably on your competitor's staff. And so you can't get them anyways. Um, but you do have to worry about how your competitors are utilizing them to this degree. And so the, the domain experts aren't often the folks that people think they are. You know, they're, they're probably not, you know, um, PhDs in statistics and, and, and math. They're, they're people that, that have been on the front line of your business. They're people like your plant manager who has repaired that machine 10 times last year and knows all 10 times it broke down and also knows that this other machine over here hasn't broken, hasn't broke down in 15 years. So why would we put a sensor on it when the, when the machine on the right is, is the one that gives us all the trouble? Um, it's people like the shift foreman, which to a much greater de degree has much more information about what happens on a day-to-day -day basis of, well, that machine's breaking down because we're misusing it or we're using it for a purpose that it wasn't designed for. Um, and, and maybe we need to uh, consider that. It's also people that, that are in non-technical kinds of roles, like a sales rep. A sales rep will understand how your customers use your equipment, how, how your processes work, and also very important if you're talking about preventative maintenance, um, if you're going to initiate a IoT project based on preventative maintenance, it has to, has to involve your repair techs because they have the knowledge of when I go out to repair a machine and it needs part X, most of the time it also needs part Y. So we ought to be start looking at the correlation between those. And so that's really what IoT is all about. It's about collecting data and then it's about making correlations with that data. So let's say that we've gotten together and we've we've engaged all the right people, we've we've done all the right things with our with our stakeholders and we have IT involved and and we've and we've gotten our our domain experts and our sensor experts and our data engineers together and we figured out what data we're going to collect and and we've we've launched a little prototype project, not a not a crazy big project, but a prototype project to go collect some data. What do you do with the data when it comes in? And I'm going to break with with convention here uh, in, in the IoT industry and say you you work with what you're comfortable with, um, and you start small here also, like you know, just like you wouldn't start by instrumenting every bearing and every shaft on every machine in your, uh, in your industrial facility, I would claim you want to start small with the analysis also. And so what we like to, to, to talk with customers about is to say, look, what are you comfortable with? You know, the most important thing about this data is it's your data and you need to own your data in the end and you need to own the analyses of it and you need to contribute to that analysis of it. You know, this, this person who's a domain expert is probably, as I mentioned, not a, not, uh, you know, not a uh, degreed statistics engineer, um, but it's very possible they understand Excel and they've been using it for 15 years. 
you know, to, to enter in information about the process. And, you know, folks, you know, folks need to understand that if that's what you're comfortable with and that can get you value in the early run, let's go for that. Use that. If you're a um, if you're a very highly technical organization, you might use something like a MATLAB or a NumPy to because you do highly technical data analysis. And just bring it into those tools if that's what you're comfortable with. If you're com if you are um, very you know sophisticated in your SAP or SAS integration or your Oracle integration, use that as the place to view that data. I will say just kind of overall. Use what you're comfortable with and, and don't let a new IoT project turn into a brand new large scale um, um, data analysis project before you even understand what data is useful. So I've been beating around the bush and hinting about it here, but I'll just come right out and say it that the most important thing is to start small, choose some small wins, some low-hanging fruit, um, be prepared to fail, which is a, which is a big part of, of, of this process. In other words, be prepared to realize that, okay, we're gonna start small and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go instrument these three or four things on this machine. And one of them was no use at all. And so you want to have wasted, and I'll put quotes around that, you want to have wasted, you know, on the order of five-digit numbers, not seven-digit numbers. And so, because you're, this will let you place many small bets, and a few of them are really going to pay off. So, you begin by identifying an opportunity, then prototype the data collection, off-the-shelf sensors, low-tech analysis, so that I, just like the last slide said, whatever you're comfortable with, if that means it's Microsoft Excel, that's great. And you analyze that data, and you evaluate your return on investment. This is where you go back to your, your um, uh, domain experts in your company and say, was this new data helpful to you at all? What should we do next? And they'll lead you, they'll guide you. So lastly, just kind of wrap all of this together. Um, you know, it's important to get started. It's important to engage all those stakeholders. You don't want to, at the 11th hour, have a prototype sensor system ready to go and have IT, have that be the first time you've, in, you've invited IT to the meeting and they look at it and say, how can we put this on our network? This isn't suitable for our network. They had to be in the room to begin with. Um, so you need to engage all those stakeholders. You need to collect data and analyze and evaluate whether that data is suitable for you. And then finally, it, it, it's, this isn't a one-shot thing. This is an iterative process. You do the small win, you get the small win with, with all of your internal customers, including your C-level sponsor, and you say, look, we've, been, we've improved the, the throughput or downtime on, on this machine by, by 43%. Now let's take that win and, and, and let's, let's start another small project to look at this other machine that is similar. This iterative process is, is, is going to pay back in terms of the chance of success of your IoT project. So again, I uh, wish to thank you for your, for your attention, and um, it will be, uh, I'll be back on later for questions. And Kevin, I'll send this back to you. Well, thanks, Ed. I was on mute there for a second. Sam, I'm sorry. Would you please go ahead and start your presentation on the Agile methodology? Thanks so much. Uh, yes, thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Ed, as well, uh, given some uh, hints and foreshadowing into my, my discussion here. Uh, so this afternoon, uh, I want to kind of focus on a little bit of the how to do what Ed just described. Uh, I want to figure out how we can use our data to improve both our products and our processes. And we're going to do that by looking at uh, what it really means to use this data and how to fit it into what a good uh, cyclical process should be. 
Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I really like to impress upon our teams here is that we want to focus on continually improving. And to continually improve, we need to be able to know what we're not doing well and what we are doing well. So uh, the way we do that is by gathering data. And unfortunately, a lot of times people treat data as this uh, step in the process, as, as something that is to be accomplished and completed. But really, data is not static. Data, like everything else in our world here, is constantly changing. And therefore, we, the way we treat it should constantly change. We should continuously be learning from this data uh, using the experts that know what this data can do, using the experts on our team that know how to do the things that we do, and use that continuously to improve the things that we do. Now, as we get started in here, I kind of want to talk a very brief uh, moment here on what is this agile thing. Uh, it's, it's something that's very prevalent in a lot of the software world as far as higher level applications, the web world, the Googles, the Amazons. Um, but it, it's fairly new to the IIoT world. And, and this is something that I've enjoyed bringing to SDS since I've joined. Um, in a nutshell, Agile is a mindset. So Agile is a way of thinking about the problems and the products and the processes. It's not a set of practices. So this mindset is focusing on the value. Well, what is it that we really want to give our customers? What is it that they really need? Uh, this mindset is getting continuous customer feedback. We do that by, by continuously delivering things to them. And I'll talk a little bit further later on what that really means. And this mindset is also simplicity. And that speaks to what Ed just described of, of taking small chunks and small risks so that when you fail, it's not a major uh, uh, disaster. It's, it's, it's a small stepping stone in this, and a way to learn. By keeping things simple, it allows us to keep things smaller and learn from those more easily. So that's this agile mindset. Uh, a couple of the, the practices and, and, and principles that build from that mindset here uh, that are that relate to what we're talking about is in the way we structure our delivery cycle and the way we structure our teams. Uh, so again, again, Ed uh, in, in informed us in, on what this overall cycle is. And so just to reiterate that, we want to look at our products as a cyclical uh, method. It, it this this picture on the left here is meant to look like the infinity sign for a reason. We are meant to be continuously delivering, examining, planning, building, testing our products until the end of the life of that product. Um, you know, it, it's meant to be something that happens continuously so that we can continually improve the product and continually improve how we build that product. Now, the how really is, is, is used by the teams. And so, again, out of this Agile mindset, we have built this idea of a team structure that is kind of different than your typical team structure. Uh, if you were to look at a, an organization diagram from, say, 15, 20 years ago, you're not going to see uh, a Venn diagram, any sort of intertwining piece, you're going to see departments. You're going to see basically a big hierarchical pyramid. The way that Agile has designed this is to utilize everyone's expertise in the way that, the, that, that best benefits the entire product. So on the right side here, we kind of have our delivery team. And picture this whole diagram inside of the circle that Ed had described. And so we, the delivery team are your engineers, they are your developers, your testers, the people that know how to build something. They know how to implement it. 
On the left side here, you have what we call the value team. This is the, the, the business folks. These are the guys that interact with the customers daily. They really know how to gather the needs of your customers. And the picture here is that these two teams need to be intertwined. And how this applies to our discussion today is that your SMEs are all over this picture. Okay, the, you have experts in different fields all throughout your organization, as Ed mentioned. And so we wanna make sure we utilize this by having a, a full team working together as opposed to being uh, dependent upon a single person at a single time. So as I wrap up our little discussion here on Agile, I wanted to give you a few terms that uh, I'll be using throughout the rest of this talk just to give you a little bit of an understanding of, of what I'm saying and hopefully to help you understand better the main pick point of what I'm trying to get. Uh, the first term here is a user story. Really all this is is a requirement, but instead of focusing on the implementation of it like a typical traditional requirement, this focuses on what the user needs. So it would be something like uh, the user needs to be able to mow their lawn instead of uh, the, the, the requirement is that you give me a lawnmower with four wheels and uh, four blades. Uh, a sprint is a small iterative cycle. Uh, just like we talked about with, with trying things small, this is like the smallest piece of that cycle. Uh, the, this is uh, the piece where we go and we do a small chunk of work. We deliver it in some way to the customer and continue to get their feedback. And I put release on here for a reason because this really defines anything that goes to a customer. There are companies, uh, particularly the very large companies, uh, are becoming very, very good at releasing small things. And you do this by controlling what you release. This doesn't have to be your final end-all product. This could be a demonstration. It could be a document. It could be a questionnaire out to find out what, what users might want. Um, but the idea here is to continuously seek feedback from uh, the, the customers and your, your, your target audience for your product, okay? So how do we take this idea of continuously improving and using data to do this and apply it to our actual teams? Well, the main person that's going to be doing this or persons is, is going to be playing what I call the data scientist role. Now, most places aren't gonna have the ability or the need really for a full-time data scientist on each team, just like Ed was describing. You know, you're not gonna need a PhD in data science or in statistics on every one of your teams. But that's why there's a, a, a good differentiation here between a role and a job. So a role is a responsibility that you have for a specific period of time. I might play a testing role in one of my sprints, which means I am doing testing for two weeks, but that's not necessarily my job. My job is this larger set of tasks that I need to accomplish, and it's an indeterminate period of time. So what we like to do is focus people on roles because roles allow flexibility. They allow people to step up in the areas that they excel in while jobs in the traditional sense, they, they tend to create silos. They limit creativity and productivity on your projects. So what this really means for data science here is we want people who are cross-disciplined. This might be a data scientist that is interested in your engineering. It might be an engineer that is interested in data science. Uh, we have implemented this with great success in both of those uh, uh, paradigms. We've had engineers that have been interested in data science and data scientists that have been interested in engineering. By implementing this role on your teams, 
these people will be able to provide insights into problems and the solutions for those problems that most of us wouldn't consider because we really only see the one side of the picture. By allowing this cross-discipline role, you get people who can see both sides of the picture, the, the engineering, the implementation, as well as the data analysis. And that really helps us to solve problems in a more creative and, and more productive way. So what does this data scientist role really do? Well, they help us to understand the why. So they help us to understand why is this thing happening? Why are we having this issue? Why are we not getting the data that we expect? Why are we getting this data? They also take that knowledge and they help us to better design the how. You know, how, how best do we implement this sensor? How best do we include this sensor on this larger system? Uh, and by having them as a full-time part of our team, they allow us to make the answer to the question of when be continuously. Okay, these people already understand the inner workings of your system. They are already on your team. As Ed mentioned, the, the, the best SMEs that you have are already in your organization. These people have to live with the product that you're, you're developing. They have to live with the processes that you've implemented. So by these people that are already in your organization playing the data scientist role, you are, they, they have a leg up on using this data to improve your product and your processes. But how do these people, how does this role help you? Well, one of the ways that they work to help us is they use data to improve the how. This is to how to improve the way we are doing things, our processes, okay? Because they are living as part of the team, they have to deal with the processes just like everybody else. The problem is many people, or, or sorry, many teams, don't have this role and therefore they the 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 team members don't seem to have that dual vision that I kind of implied earlier. So this data scientist role, they have to live with the processes and that's that's kind of a subjective perspective. It's it's how it feels to them. But they also understand the data and that gives them an objectivity of this is what is really happening. And so this data scientist role really gives you that checks and balances between how it feels to work on this team along with what are we really producing? How, how uh, much value are we providing to the customer? So the role here of the data scientist when we're talking about improving the how is really to provide that bridge between Objectivity, which is what you know your management is going to see of the data that's coming through, and subjectivity of how the team feels in in what how they are working in the processes that they are living in. Some of the metrics that we use to to do this, and this is just a very very small sampling of the metrics that are out there, are uh, sprint velocity, lead time, and technical debt. Sprint velocity uh, is basically a measure of how much your team can accomplish in a small period of time and in whatever your sprint cadence is. Uh, this allows us to focus our features and improvements to accomplishable sizes. So it allows us to chop things down and try things iteratively and in small pieces so that we can accomplish things, get that feedback, and monitoring this data, understanding how to use this data, is critical to being able to make those decisions. Lead time is the amount of time that it takes for a feature to go from idea 
to release. So from, from inception to end. This is also something that we want to be short. It is something that as the data scientists, they can examine, they can monitor this data. They can tell us how to track this data. And this again helps us to reach that constant feedback cycle that we're, we're reaching for of small iterative uh, releases so that we can successfully build a product that customers actually need and actually benefits them. Technical debt is the cost of rework that was caused by choosing, say, an easy or limited solution now over a uh, potentially better architected solution now that might take longer to uh, implement. Now, this seems like it could be contradictory that, that this is a, a piece of data that wants us to take longer now that rather than shorter. But see, this is the beauty of data and data science and how it can help improve our processes. This gives us a whole picture because there has to be a balance between doing things quickly and iteratively and doing things that are going to last for the long term. And again, these are just a very small sampling of data, but picking data correctly and well to inform us and have the whole picture is really going to be the benefit of having data as part of your team. That is what this data scientist role can do to help improve the how of what we do. Now on the other side of things, we also want our data to improve the product itself. And this is where kind of data-driven requirements come in. So in the same way that we allow this data to feed into our process improvement, we should have this data feed into our product improvement. So how are customers using your device? What are they using the most? What are they using the least? On the web side of things, this is extremely easy to do. Uh, there are many, many tools for pretty much every hosting company out there to determine uh, how many people are using your site, what pages are they visiting the most, how long are they staying here, all this type of data. And those types of things are also available in the IIoT world and in embedded devices. It just isn't quite as prevalent. It, it's something that's becoming newer uh, in this world. So we could do things like sending up a little bit of extra data. You know, as Ed mentioned in your, your typical IIoT uh, uh, project, you're gonna be sending data up from the sensor to the gateway and up into the cloud. Well. Maybe you could piggyback on that and send up a little bit of extra data that could help you figure out, say, how is the customer using this? Or perhaps you utilize built-in networking capabilities. When you get those messages from the gateway up in the cloud, you'll be able to determine a general location or you know, what, what the state of the United States are they in or things like that. You could determine connectivity states. How often has this gateway sent up data? How much data has it sent up? Um, all of these things can be very beneficial to determining how your customers are using your device. And what we want to do is we want to incorporate this data into our release cycle. We want to do that by asking three questions. First, we want to ask, where are our devices being used? When we know where, that allows us to adjust our features, our hardware, the enclosures, what IP rating it needs, that can help us design and it'll go around the cycle and build into the next iteration. We also wanna ask how are our devices being used? Okay, that will also allow us to adjust features, but it will allow us to say, expand the features that are most used, maybe improve the features that are least used, okay? And the last question we want to ask is, what are they using our IoT devices for? Are they using it for real-time monitoring, historical data, et cetera? Those types of answers can help us to determine 
What are the new features we need to add? Okay, the idea is that all of this data that we're gathering in can become the requirements for our next iteration. Typically, IIoT doesn't lend itself to easy customer feedback in the traditional methods, but by expanding our capabilities, thinking outside of the box, uh, it, this data will allow us to automate the process of customer feedback and allow us to have data-driven requirements, requirements that will allow us to build the products that our customers really need. So instead of asking the customers, but perhaps not just instead of, but perhaps if they are unable to answer, we can ask the data. Data can answer a lot of questions for us that are often very difficult to get answers for. It can provide us ways to continuously improve both our products and our processes. Data and data science is not a one and done. This should be something that is continuous. This is something that we should be including into our incremental and continuous product life cycle. That is the most valuable use of data science is, is continuously improving both our products and our processes. And I'll leave you with, with this thought that I said at the beginning and I wanna iterate it again. Data is not static and so our use of it should not be static either. Uh, thank you for uh, your time and I think we're gonna jump into questions now back uh, over to you, Kevin. Well, uh, thanks so much, Sam. I thought that was a great point that you made that really because of the shortage of data scientists, if for no other reason, uh, it's going to be the engineers learning about data science and uh, assuming that kind of a role and that's really going to lead to the takeoff in analytics and machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. So uh, th thanks for that. I really appreciated it. Um, now our presenters will answer questions from the audience. Type your questions for our presenters in the ask a question box and we'll get to as many as time allows. Uh, questions that we don't get to today will be posted online with the archived version of the webcast. To download a copy of the presentation and other resources, use the event resources tab on the left hand side of your screen. Now Sam, I, I've got a question for you and you talked about how the agile methodology can be applied to the kind of cybersecurity software development that you were doing in the past and IIoT projects that you're more involved in today. I can see where, you know, the characteristics of the two might be similar in many ways. Uh, talk a little bit about how they're different, though. Of course. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so a lot of the things that we do in the IIoT world involve physical items. And it's a lot more difficult and a lot more time consuming to build something physical than it is to build something in software. And so while the mindset itself of Agile, of, of focusing on value and continuous deployment and simplicity applies to both places, uh, that's that's diff, more difficult to do in a world that revolves around hardware. And so some of the things that we've had to do is we've had to kind of redefine what it means for us to do a release. We've had to redefine what it means uh, for us to get customer feedback. Uh, as I mentioned here towards the end, uh, <clears throat> customer feedback in the you know, software slash web world is, is usually fairly easy. It's just gathered as part of hosting the site out there. But in the embedded world, these are things you have to prepare for and think of. And so that's something that we have grown and learned over the years here is how can we still implement that mindset of continuous improvement and continuous feedback while taking into account the fact that it takes longer for hardware to happen. And you can't just 
deliver out a new piece of hardware to somebody every two weeks. And so there are a lot of things we've done to try to um, reapply this mindset in a world that just doesn't necessarily lend itself quite as easily to continuous delivery. Good. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I had a question for you. You're involved in a lot of and exposed to a lot of different projects. And I always wonder when people are getting involved in IIoT projects, are they typically looking to uh, optimize process control or are they using process control information to improve production management? So we see both. Um, it is often the case that they are looking to solve a specific type of problem. Um, it's, it, it's, it's sometimes the case that they're, that they're just looking to generally optimize process control. But I would say more often it's the latter that you mentioned, where they have process control data and they're trying to understand how to use that data to improve some other part of their system or their product or often the service of their of their product. So I think that it's you know uh, I, I think that that we see both. It's often the case, and, and and partly it's it's you know it's something that that we tend to call um, the imagination gap. Um, you know, folks have data already from their process control, so they can conceive using that data for other places. But sometimes uh, folks don't know what they could have in terms of data, and so they don't kind of make that leap of imagination to the next step. And that's where it's really important to have that, that triangle that I mentioned about the, the uh, domain expert saying, well, here's the data I wish I had, and the sensor engineer and the analyst saying, well, you could have this data that you're asking for, but the problem you're trying to solve could be much easier to solve or you'd have a much higher quality answer if we gave you this other data that we can get with this sensor and we can do this analysis on. Good, thank you. Sam, uh, a question for you. I mean, perhaps it's an unfair question to start, but to your mind, who's more important, the subject matter or the data scientist when it comes to a successful project? Uh, well, actually, that's a, that's a great question, Kevin. Uh, I would argue that it's both. Uh, so kind of looking at that picture again uh, that, I, that I had up there of how the value team and the delivery team intertwine, I would say that the, the same thing should come into play when we're talking about subject matter experts and, and data scientists. Um, the, the expertise that people have is immensely influenced by their history and their experience. And so even when you look at people that have the same job title, data scientist A and data scientist B are going to have widely different experiences, capabilities, and therefore they're going to have wildly different inputs into your uh, project, into your process. And so uh, when, whenever I get asked the question of, well, who's more important here with him or her, uh, my answer always comes back as they're equally as important. Because everyone, uh, when, when you make sure that you are hiring quality motivated people, everyone has valuable insight, valuable inputs. And that's the beauty of a team focused uh, uh, product is you're going to get the the most creative solution. I always tell our guys here, everything that uh, will will be better through multiple people than it is through one. Great. And and speaking of teams, Sam, let's keep on a question for you here. And wh what do you think are some of the key points to make when building? Uh, a culture of, of a team in, a, in an engineering or other type of environment? So one of the responses that I get when I, when I teach these Agile courses is that, you know, that sounds really great, but in my company, 
and then they they go on and explain why it wouldn't work you know culture and all that and culture is crucially important to being able to implement uh, this agile mindset but there are tips and techniques that you can do to begin to encourage people and, and get them to see the value and see that's how people learn the best is when they can see that something is working and helping them as opposed to just being told. So two things that I always do, uh, well, I always encourage people to do when they are trying to bring in this mindset to a culture that might not fit nicely into it is, first of all, ask people to try something and set a time box. So what I mean by that is, let's say you want to uh, implement uh, sprints so that you can get feedback from customers, even if it's just a, a small demonstration at the end. Ask people to try it for two sprints or three sprints. Say, give it a good try, see what happens, and if it doesn't work out, then we'll get, jump back to the chalkboard and figure out what would work next. And the other thing I ask is, be introspective. So I know that you've done this for X number of decades and it's worked well and you are very good at what you do, but does that mean you can't get any better? And so if you can get better, let's work together and figure out how you can get better, how we can get better as a team and produce better products. Good, thanks, Sam. Uh, Ed, a question for you. I'm just curious, we've been talking about IIoT and analytics for a couple of years now, and I'm wondering if you're seeing any trends emerging in terms of uh, application types or uh, environments where uh, IIoT is seeing a lot of activity or, or any kind of market or technology indicators that you've noticed recently. I think that one of the one of the um, biggest trends that's really having an uptick is uh, cellular wireless communications, and and that is very important to industrial IoT because many of the places where you need to place a sensor, you don't have uh, you know the opportunity to even get Wi-Fi to that to that place. And so, with these, with the you know uh, emergence of uh, the low cost, low bandwidth cellular technologies like NB-IoT and LTE CAT M1, those two have allowed sensors to be placed in places where you couldn't place them five years ago, um, because one, you'd have to have a significantly more battery to power a a full up cellular modem on on LTE, and two. You just couldn't afford the fifty dollars a month data fee, but now you're talking, you know, more on the lines of, of of a dollar or two a month to send a little bit of data. That has opened up a lot of possibilities that just weren't just weren't capable of of, of being being addressed. At the same time, the idea of very low cost, very low power uh, sensors that have very long battery life. And that is another place where just uh, it, it is. It's not necessarily uh, both of these. Both of these aren't necessarily involved in brand new fancy analytics, but it's rather places where we can get data from that we just couldn't in the past. Good, great answer, Ed. Sam, the final question for today is for you, and and, and give us some idea how transformational do you think? analytics and machine learning are going to be in terms of uh, production and process control environments, engineering, or, or even in our daily lives? So I think that the onset of machine learning, data science, can only benefit us in everything we do, both the products that we produce, the way we live our lives, all the technology that's surrounding us. Something that I have learned over my uh, 15 plus years of doing this kind of product improvement, process improvement is you improve by looking at what you've done previously. And so taking that paradigm 
of learning from our mistakes, I mean, there's a reason that's a saying, we're, we're applying that to our technology and, and that's going to significantly increase the focus of that technology. It's going to point it to where it needs to be. It's going to provide us with the capabilities that it needs. It's going to simplify it. There's just so many things that it's going to do as we look back and learn from data that was not previously available to us. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks to everybody in our audience for the great questions. Uh, thanks again to Ed and Sam for sharing their time and expertise. I'd like to also extend special thanks to our sponsor, Epicor, uh, and for their support. And now that we're just about done, we'd like to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Plant Engineering, I'd like to thank you all for attending. That concludes our webcast, and we'll see you next time.